Time Magazine not too long ago, um, within the last six months, I guess, something like that. I'm sure Jerry knows the exact date. Uh, came out with an issue that of the 25 most important, was that the? Influential. Most influential, it's safe, that's even better. Most influential people in America. And two of the 25 are here, not bad. Uh, Frank Gehry was the architect and he'll be on later on talking about his masterpiece with Thomas Krenz, the Guggenheim Museum in Bilboa, Spain. And Jerry Laybourne is here with us this morning, somebody who I've known since she was a humble teacher in Philadelphia and uh, I was short, fat, and an architect in Philadelphia with a longer beard and the same sparkly eyes. Jerry. I'm one of those Ted virgins that uh, Ricky keeps talking about, and I'm not proud of it, I'll tell you that. It does, it does not feel good to be a first-timer. I wish I'd been here years before with all of the excitement that surrounds this conference. But I am thrilled to be here this morning to talk about two subjects that I'm really passionate about, women and children. And I thought I'd start with children first, since I know all of you were at least once a child and uh, actually very few of you in the audience were ever a woman. <laughs> <laughs> Although after uh, Nathan's presentation yesterday, I'm sure you all wish you were. <laughs> um, and I, I thought I'd start with children anyway because you all know that basically who you are gets set when you're in child, when when you're a child and you know we basically can predict from looking at kids behavior who they're going to end up being. We used to, when we were in focus groups, we used to sit behind the mirror and look at the kids sitting around the table and predict which one was going to end up being Rupert Murdoch and you know which one was going to end up being Ricky Saul Worman. Um, and yesterday when Nathan was speaking, I realized that, you know, he really, as a kid, you know that he worked out that whole dinosaur thing with little plastic animals. You know he knows the answer, and he's just used this as a ruse to have a hobby as an adult. <laughs> and you know that Ricky Worman in his kindergarten class, he, he brought those Dymo labels in, you know, and he had a whole system for categorizing the cubbies. They were alphabetical. And then he had, uh, all the toys were uh, assigned a category, so that was his categorical as assignation. And uh, the recess he did on two different spheres, time and location. <laughs> and the only thing we couldn't figure out about him in kindergarten was, how did he get all that stuff in his cubby? <laughs> you know, uh, Danny Hillis, I know exactly what he was like as a kid because I've actually met him as a kid. I've met his daughter, India. And uh, I don't know how to break it to the Mattel folks, but India is never going to be playing with that comb your Barbie doll. <laughs> India, India's play patterns are something like this. She takes one doll and puts it in one chair, and she takes another doll and puts it in another chair, and then she tries to get them to actually have a speaking relationship to each other. And you know that her designs on Barbie are far more significant than cutting her hair. And she is going to implant artificial intelligence in Barbie. <laughs> and uh, that'll be, a, I guess, a whole new business, but Danny, you should get a, get a piece of it. And Ken Oletta, now what would he have been in kindergarten? Wouldn't he be the kid who raised his hand and said, Mrs. Morrissey, Nancy Sue had her eyes open during the Lord's Prayer? <laughs> and Mrs. Morrissey says back, well, why, why do you know this, Ken? Well, I'm responsible for reporting it all. <laughs> In any case, sorry, Ken. I hardly ever get to say anything back about him. Um, so, you know, you look at me. I met Ricky in Philadelphia. I was a hippie. I never smelled bad, but I was a hippie, and I was a teacher. And, you know, you look at me and you think, how the heck could she have 
started a business that's worth five billion dollars today. Well, if you knew about my childhood, you would see the roots of how I got there. My father um, decided that because I was sandwiched between two really extraordinary sisters, my older sister was beautiful and perfect, and my younger sister was charismatic and brilliant, my dad looked at me and said, Honey, you're my business daughter. <laughs> and he... So we didn't play like games of baseball or go fish or anything like that. He would give me pro formas of companies and say, should I invest in this? It was a joyous childhood. <laughs> and he would say, now listen, I have this opportunity. There's this company, they, they manufacture preformed toilets for garages, for automobile, for uh, gas stations. And uh, I thought, geez, that's really something. And then we went to Disneyland and I said, Dad, buy stock in Disney. Don't buy tidy toilets. And he said, no, no, there are many, many more gas stations in America than there are Disneylands. So he bought tidy toilets and he did not die, he did not die a rich man. But in any case, he gave me a lot of confidence. My intuition obviously was better than his. And uh, so even though I never took a single business course, I had a lot of confidence. The other part of my childhood that's significant is when I was three, television got delivered to our house. They actually had installers who brought the television and plugged it in. My mother said, hello, television. And the television said right back to her like that, hello out there in television land. So I'm probably the only American who grew up thinking that television was interactive. <coughs> <laughs> and I would get dressed up in my very best party dress and sit in front of the television hoping that Hopalong Cassidy would like me as much as I liked him. It was pathetic. Um, just two other things about my childhood. I knocked a fourth grader boy out once. <clears throat> he, he threw a snowball at my sister. And in my family, you did not attack a family member. And so I hit him in the solar plexus. He went out cold and he's really had a very sad life. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I have kept tabs on him. So I'm a second child, I've already told you that. And the truth about me is that I am one of those born to rebel children. I didn't go into television to have a career or to build a business. I went into television because I thought it was a disgrace for kids, a waste of time, limited creatively, and I thought that kids deserved a heck of a lot better. So I did a really radical thing with my background as a teacher. I actually brought kids into the process. I asked their opinions. I watched how they looked at things. I actually spent years showing them film as art films to try to stretch and see what they would tolerate in terms of creative. But a breakthrough happened one day in Danbury, Connecticut in the early 80s when we went out and we asked a really innocuous question to kids. We asked them, what do you like about being kids? And we got back this torrent. They felt pressured to grow up. They didn't even want to be called kids. They didn't feel like they had a childhood. They didn't feel like anybody understood them. They were terrified of becoming teenagers. They were terrified of uh, teen suicide. They, one kid said they thought when you became a teenager, your brain shrank. And they wanted us to be a place where they could have a childhood. Now, if you go, dial back to my description of my childhood, I forgot to tell you about sending away for all the brochures of every foreign country and, and alphabetizing them and filing them away. But I think that I really connected with these kids very deeply because my own childhood had not been like a, like a raucous, you know, wild party. And we saw this mission for us. We could be on the side of kids and we could put kids first and we could really make <coughs> them feel like we understood them. What I did next was collect a group of people around me who were as passionate about kids as I was. And in fact, only one of our employees had ever worked in television, and he was from Canada. So, I'm sorry. If you, if you, I'm sorry, that was cruel. <laughs> um, 
there's a connection there between competitive Americans and Canadians, but we won't get into that. The fisticuffs I told you about in the fourth grade, I think, is a really important thing to remember about me. Because one of the things I did best at Nickelodeon was protect this very earnest group of people who wanted to do something good from, for kids from an ever-changing corporate culture. I kept the MBAs away from us. And we took up the kids' cause. And any time anyone said to us that kids just like animation, we would turn around and invent live action shows that would be the highest rated shows on television in one season. And anyone ta time, anyone would tell us that kids just like pre-sold toys to be the center of their animated cartoons, we said that is the stupidest thing we ever heard. What kids like are cartoons and characters that speak to them and that are relevant to them and that come from creators who have those characters living inside them. And we went around the country and we found people like Jim Jenkins who had Doug. Has anybody ever seen Doug? Well, Doug is, I think, the most decent cartoon on television where the hero is an 11-year-old boy who, who acts out of common decency. And we found Ren and Stimpy, and of course I didn't know at the time that both Ren and Stimpy were living inside John Chris Felusi, but not a happy combination. But, you know, this really changed the children's television landscape, and it turned people from just being marketers of toys to people who started to do television that had real stories. When we heard things like program only to boys, girls will watch anything, well, that was my personal favorite. We developed shows like Clarissa Explains It All and Alex Mack. We concentrated on connecting with kids, not on competing. In my business, my shallow television business, and I appreciate the fact that you've let me speak here today since I think I'm the only television person on the agenda. Um, most television executives look this way all the time to see what the other networks are doing to make sure that they don't get a leg up on them. We kept our focus completely on kids. And everything we did was about kids. Everything we thought about was how do we put kids first. Our, the way we managed ourselves, the way we designed our playful spaces, the architecture in our office. We believe that you are what you eat. We put our studio right in the middle of Universal Studios Florida in Orlando because we wanted to be near kids. We tried to stand up for kids and counter the image that kids have in the media of being careless, materialistic, greedy, non-caring monsters. We invented things like the Big Help where we taught kids how to volunteer and then we gave them a chance to volunteer live on the air and kids volunteered 30 million hours of time the first year, 50 the second year and 100 million the third year and we got to advertise that to the press. We stood up for kids. When we went into consumer products we had 10 commandments. The first commandment was thou shalt not listen to the marketplace. I tell you all of this because we were clearly interested in kids and only kids. Everyone at Nickelodeon bled orange and they knew the mission statement to connect with kids and connect kids with their world through entertainment. It was not left to the marketing department to find our key attributes. Everyone in the company knew what they were. And by the way, this is a Nickelodeon brain, orange. This was the kind of toy that we thought was like an inventive, fun thing to do. But you can't comb its hair. Um, what resulted was an incredibly strong bond and what's happened in the marketplace is that Nickelodeon gets 53% of all kids kid TV viewing. I mean we thought big, we thought you know maybe we could get a couple of networks out of the Saturday morning business but basically Nickelodeon by being true to its audience and feeling that its audience was a cause really accomplished something. So I left Nickelodeon um, about a year ago and I went to Disney and ABC and I, went, I did that because I wanted a broader canvas. I wanted to deal with issues 
to deal with women, and I wanted to deal with issues to deal with families. We saw at Nickelodeon before I left that there was a big shift from the early 80s and that kids today talk more about wanting to connect with their families and have really meaningful time with their parents. And it was very difficult for Nickelodeon to take a family platform because it had established itself so strongly as a kid-only platform. So Disney uh, offered me that opportunity. In the early research we've done with the Disney Channel, all of the, my suspicions were actually completely true. And uh, we've, we've been through a process where we've brought thinkers from the outside in to talk to us about what's happening with today's family. They're certainly not the family that Disney is, is associated with in its history. They're no longer two parents, two kids, and a goldfish, but it's a much broader concept of family. And it's interesting to hear people describe their relationships as a family. Families are much more diverse, but families have fallen to a new level of low esteem in this country. Pat Schroeder, the former congresswoman, came to speak to us, and one of the things she said was that 70% of all people who are late for work will lie about why they were late for work. They will never say it was a family problem. They will say it was car trouble. Now that is a phenomenal fact. We see our job as not talking about family values on the Disney Channel, but valuing families and actually advertising what families can do together. We will take on the cause the same way that we took on the kids' cause with Nickelodeon. We will try to provide programming that will help kids and parents think about other things that they can do together outside of the television universe, but also provide moments where these folks can have a demilitarized zone where they can have a calm and a calm place where they can really share something that's meaningful to them. It's quite poignant when you listen to these kids, eight-year-old kids, talking about their biggest desire is quality time with their parents and they use that word. The Disney Company has been entertaining families for decades in parks and in the movies and we have a great platform at the Disney Channel to elevate the status of families. We're also developing a new brand for kids and I, when I accepted this speaking invitation from Ricky, I had hoped that I would be able to talk to you about that. I can't, it's not fully cooked, but I'll just tell you it's been in the press a tiny bit and um, it is a learning channel and the, the one thing I will tell you is that TV has lost its stranglehold on kids. For the first time in 25 years, the average time that kids watch television has dropped by um, four hours a week, gone from 25 to 21. <laughs> and the computer is completely the reason that that's happened. So anything that you see from us, you can <coughs> expect that we will be developing a brand that is not just a TV brand, but a cross-media brand. And Jim Henson was once asked, uh, are you disappointed with how bad television is, that it's never really developed into much of a medium? And he responded in his sweet and wonderful way, why would you be so impatient? Television is a brand new medium, it's just begun. So I guess I have the same optimism that maybe we can do better for kids and uh, do it, and with the help of the computer, make this really interactive the way I always thought it was going to be. In terms of, of lifetime and women, uh, just a few decades ago, when women grew up, they got married or not, had children or not, and waited for the rest of their lives to happen to them. The world's changed a lot since then. We've gone through the stage where women entering the workforce enter, had faced considerable animosity from women who were, not, were at home. I was one of those people. My best friend from elementary school called me one day and said, well, I've read about you in the paper. I understand you pick your career over having children. I have two children, 
and nobody ever could accuse me of ever picking anything over my kids. But that was the kind of thing we faced. And what's exciting about the research we've done with Lifetime in the past six months is that there is much more tolerance on the part of women for each other. The, our attitude is, hey, if you made it at home nurturing your kids, way to go. If you find fulfillment there, fantastic. If you find fulfillment at the office, fantastic. And man, if you can balance it all, hallelujah, sister, you are it. This is an extraordinary change for women because we've been through a very tumultuous time and this is great news for Lifetime because we have a platform where we can build the community that women are looking for and that women will embrace. What's really exciting about women is that women under 30 are much more life-driven than man-driven. Sorry guys, but you are not the center of the universe for these young women. And you better get your plumage out. They have a very can-do attitude. They think they're entitled to a point of view and that they can do something about it and that they can be who they want to be. Women deserve a place on TV that understands them, that understands their sense of humor. Yes, we are darn funny and our lives are filled with frustrating things that are darn funny. And it's, our, it's about time that we had a place that would reflect that. Women are getting ready to stand tall about what we know. We've been really shy over the last couple of years, decades. For many older women like myself, we've had to work within a male world, one that is not our natural habitat. Our natural nurturing style brings a balance to the world that is sorely needed. Imagine a world where women feel fulfilled, productive, and are able to bring their strengths their intuition, their collaborative style, their desire to build relationships to whatever enterprise, business, societal, or family. And I imagine it would be a better world for men as well. Scott Cook described the soon-to-be outmoded militaristic targeted marketing model. I hope the same is true of the militaristic win-lose command and control style of management that seems to inculcate more fear than bravery in our business institutions today, more dogma and less vision. Thank you very much.